OK, let's find something good to end on here. Uh, actually, I like this one. Press button, receive bacon. <laughs> That's very good. Um, I am outstanding in my field. <laughs> Had that posted on my cube for a long time. And uh, oh, come on. These are all so good. Oh, OK, we'll stop on this one. It's the new chin per buffet. <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, I get New it. chin per buffet. That's awesome. <laughs> I have about an hour and a half of those pictures if you just want to watch them. <laughs> but I do have slides too. So, hello. <laughs> if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm Jeremy. And I'm going to be talking about dependency injection. And the stuff I talk about is always stuff that was really difficult for me to learn. You know, there was some kind of hurdle that I had to get over. But then I found that it became really useful to me as a developer. So I see my job right now as to help other developers take a shortcut around that. Dependency injection is especially insidious because most of the time, the way we're induced, introduced to dependency injection is we're given an application that has a DI container already in it, and you're like, OK, go. And you have to try to figure out this thing that's going on. And it looks like magic, because it is kind of magical. And I'm not good with dealing with magical stuff, because the way that you program against that is you're like, OK, well, I'll kind of copy and paste this and change a couple things and cross my fingers and hope it works. And that's not a good way to program. So we're actually going to start with the concepts of dependency injection, find out why they're really useful, and then we'll see how containers are awesome. But we're totally not going to start with that. Does that sound good? And feel free to interrupt me, ask questions, be conversational. I like to talk, but I also like to talk to people. <laughs> so I get lonely talking to myself. And then if you want to get these slides, you can head out to my website, www.jeremybytes.com, B-Y-T-E-S. And uh, I've got the slides, code samples. I also have a Pluralsight course on this topic called Dependency Injection On-Ramp, which is about three hours. And apparently, I'm not allowed to talk that long tonight. So <laughs> there's more material on that. Yeah, that's dangerous. And then uh, if you don't even want to write down my website, feel free to grab one of my contact cards. It's got my website and email address on it so that you can remember me later. So don't feel like you have to scribble everything down because it is all online in various formats. You ready to get started? So like I said, dependency injection is a topic that is important to me. And when I started talking about this, it was actually a lot longer than it feels. It's back in 2012, which seems like a really long time ago now. And when I first did this talk, I said, OK, I have to have like a good definition for what dependency injection is so that we have like a good foundation baseline that we can start with. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to go to Wikipedia because Wikipedia is nerds arguing with nerds. So I figure there's got to be a good definition out there. And so when I went out there back in 2012, I got this amazing definition that says dependency injection is a software design pattern that allows a choice of component to be made at runtime rather than compile time. And I saw this definition, and I got really, really depressed. <laughs> because this is just talking about one benefit of dependency injection, which is known as late binding, where we make uh, runtime decisions. And I would argue it's not even the most important benefit that we get from dependency injection. So I was a bit discouraged by that. But you know what? Nerds keep arguing. And so in 2013, we got this definition. Dependency injection is a software design pattern that allows the removal of hard-coded dependencies and makes it possible to change them, whether at runtime or compile time. Thinking, OK, that's getting a little closer. It's saying what kind of what our goal is. We want to remove hard-coded dependencies. But still not quite happy with that. Now the nerds kept arguing. <laughs> and this is probably my favorite one of the bunch. Dependency injection is a software design pattern that implements inversion of control and allows a program design to follow the dependency inversion principle. The term was coined by Martin Fowler. So that just removed 
all description from <laughs> dependency injection and gave me two more terms that I know nothing about, inversion of control and the dependency inversion principle. So they kind of stripped all meaning out of it. And of course, you know, the nerds kept arguing and uh, we got this one in 2015. 2016, they dialed it back a little bit, but it's still like way, way more complex than it really needs to be. So we're gonna use this definition. I love this definition. Dependency injection is a set of software design principles and patterns that enable us to develop loosely coupled code. What I really like about this is it tells me what the goal is. My goal is loosely coupled code. Now we're gonna see why that's important as we go, but, um, and, and there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can actually implement dependency injection. So it's cool because there's a lot of flexibility. But we're headed for that loose coupling. Now you might say, well, why should we listen to this guy, Mark Seaman, over Wikipedia, right? Is he more important than Wikipedia? Well, he wrote a book. And mm -hmm. if you're a book person, I'm a book person. I love books. That's how I learn. So whenever I've got a good book recommendation, I'll share it with you. If you're not a book person, feel free to ignore it. But uh, Mark Seaman actually wrote this book, which is Dependency Injection in .NET. Now, when I got this book, if you went out to Amazon and searched for Dependency Injection in .NET, there was exactly one book, which is this one. The good news is it turned out to be a very, very good book. What I like about it is that Mark has done his research. So probably on about every third page, there's a footnote that's referencing some white paper, some article, and so he's actually taken all of the material that's kind of out in the world and distilled it down into a way that's easy to understand. And so this is, if you wanna go deep dive, I'd highly recommend this. So that's why we listen to Mark Seaman. But, uh, so we talked about how our goal is loose coupling. And there's a set of benefits that we get when we have loosely coupled code. The first one is extensibility. If we have these loosely coupled pieces, it means we have kind of different pieces of code that, that we have in hopefully well-organized areas. <laughs> and then we can snap them together and in different ways. So it's really easy for us to go in and unhook one piece and hook in a new piece so that we can extend what our code's currently doing today. It's also great for late binding. And again, that's what that first Wikipedia definition was talking about. Rather than making all these decisions when we compile our application, through configuration or some other means, we can actually make these decisions when we run our application. And that actually allows us to swap out different pieces at runtime, so we don't even have to make those compile time decisions. And we'll see that uh, that actually has some good use, uses in certain situations. It also makes your code a lot harder to debug, so I'll, I'll show you that as well. And then uh, parallel development is another big one. For anyone who works on a team, the worst dialogue you can possibly get is when you go to commit your code to source control and you get that dialogue that pops up that says, how would you like to merge these files? Right, that is the absolute worst thing that you can come across. Now, the idea is that if we have multiple people on our team and our pieces are loosely coupled, that means we can have certain team members working on this set of code, certain team members working on this set of code, and they don't overlap very much. So once we've kind of defined, you know, what's, what's the interface in between these two things, we're working on our own files. So we never get that merge changes dialog because we're in our own parts of the code. And then some other things that I really like, maintainability. We can, uh, if we have these, you know, kind of modules of code that have discrete functionality, if something goes wrong, we can figure out where we need to go to fix it. Because we don't have, for example, data access sprinkled through our whole application. We've got it nicely corralled in these pieces. So we know where to go look for stuff. And then the last one is huge in my world, which is testability. Loosely coupled code is easier to isolate for unit testing. I did not used to be a unit tester. I thought I didn't need it and I was doing fine. And actually, in a sense, I was doing fine because I was meeting my users' needs and they were happy, which is my sign of success. But once I started doing unit testing, I found out it actually makes me a faster, more efficient developer. And so even though I was meeting my users' needs, with unit testing in place, I could have been going much, much faster. So testability is big in my world. So these are the benefits that we're gonna be looking at. There's also kind of a, another more ephemeral benefit, which is adherence to the solid design principles. 
If you're not familiar with SOLID, it's a set of five object-oriented design principles, S-O-L-I-D. And uh, if you're doing any kind of OO programming, you should definitely look these up. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those tonight because I always forget when I'm doing live presentations. <laughs> but if you go to my website, you'll actually find a PDF walkthrough that's got a lot of information in it if you want to follow along once you get back home. And in that, I actually talk about how dependency injection can let us hit four of these five principles as we go through. So, uh, you know, it can really assist us in that world as well. Now, these are benefits that we get from loose coupling, not necessarily from dependency injection itself. But since dependency injection helps us get to loose coupling, these end up as benefits for dependency injection. Now, when we talk about dependency injection, there's a lot of concepts that we're going to run across because there's more than one way of doing this. And we're going to be looking at a couple of these patterns, but it's good to be aware that there's a lot of different patterns out there. Tonight, we're specifically going to be looking at constructor injection and property injection, which are probably the, I would say, most common, easiest to use, and what I lean towards whenever possible. But if those don't work for your particular situation, there are other patterns, including method injection, ambient context, service locator, and others. And again, if you'd like a deep dive on these different patterns, that Mark Seaman book is an excellent resource for that. Now, we have all of these loosely coupled pieces. We need to stick them together somewhere. And this is what's called object composition, where we're taking all of these loose pieces and sticking them together. We're composing our objects. And that often happens in something that's called a composition root in an application, depending on whether you're building web apps or desktop apps. They kind of happen in different places. And then, of course, we have DI containers, which are also referred to as IOC or inversion of control containers. Now, um, most people will use DI dependency injection and IOC inversion of control interchangeably. And that's because, for practical purpose, they're interchangeable. But technically, dependency injection is a specific way of doing inversion of control. So if you're one of those really nerdy people that likes to be technical on definitions, <laughs> feel free to look that one up. <laughs> and there's a number of containers out there. These are the most popular ones. And so we have things like Unity, Castle Windsor, Ninja, Autofax, Structure Map, Spring.net. But there are many, many, many more. So I actually have, I came across a link, which hopefully I have with the materials for this talk. If it's not, I need to add it. So Scott Hanselman actually collected uh, DI containers in the .NET world. And this list uh, that he had was probably four years old. And he had 25 different containers on it. So there's a lot of options. These, like I said, are what I would call probably the most full featured ones. Some people have said, well, I want a lighter one that only does this. And so they'll build a specialized container for different reasons. Now, the good news about these um, primary ones we have here is they all do pretty much the same thing. They pretty much have the same features. And so that means that we're free to make choices of which container we use based on other things. We don't have to say which one's most capable. We can say, well, what other properties does this have? For example, Unity came out of the Microsoft Patterns and Practices team. So if you're in a group that says, we like Microsoft software, that's a good place to go. Uh, Castle Windsor is part of the larger Castle uh, open source project. So if you're using the ORM tools or other things from the Castle project, maybe you want to do that. Spring.net is actually a port of the Spring framework from the Java world. And Spring is actually much larger. The dependency injection is just a small piece of it. And so if you're in an environment that has both Java code and .NET code, that might be a good choice so that you have code that looks similar in your, across your environments. So that's what's nice about this. And then I'm going to point back to the Mark Seaman book because he actually goes through five of these containers, does exactly the same thing in all five of them to show they're all fully capable. Again, the syntax is a little different. They have different approaches, but they all have the same capabilities. So you can make your decisions based on some other stuff. That's enough talking about concepts, because we want to get to code, right? <laughs> I'm going to be spending most of the night in code, because that's how I envision things best. <laughs> and so we're going to be looking at the sample application, which is simpler than it needs to be and more complex than it needs to be, which I know that sounds 
like an oxymoron, <laughs> but that's the way it is. So it's simpler than it needs to be because it's a one-screen application. Now, to one screen, now, normally I wouldn't use dependency injection with a one-screen application, but if I were to show you like a full business application where I've used these concepts a lot, then we'd end up getting lost in the business logic code. What's this module doing? How does this fit together? Blah, 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 blah. So rather than you know, try to get through all of that business logic cruft, we're going to keep things very simple to a one-screen application. Now, it's more complicated than it needs to be because I've taken this one screen application and split it up into four distinct layers, which are all separate projects. <laughs> and again, normally I wouldn't do that for a one screen application, but since that's the architecture that we often use in larger applications, it's going to be uh, a lot easier to see the concepts that are going on. Does that make sense? Can we look at code now? Yes. Good. <laughs> Let's look at code. Okay. So. I know you guys are just waiting to see what this one screen application does. So, ta-da! <laughs> there we go, here's our one screen application. We've got two buttons on it and a list box. And I come and I click the button, boop, and it populates list box. Ta-da! No applause at all. <laughs> yeah, it's too late for the golf clap. <laughs> And for those of you who decide that you're done paying attention, you can figure out what my data set is. And if you can do that without using an internet connected device, please talk to me because you're, kind of you're the kind of geek that I want to hang out with. So this particular application is getting its data from a WCF SOAP service. So let's go ahead and take a look at the layers that we have in here. So here they are, and we're going to be walking through this code as we go. And I named my folders so that they're in the same order that they were on the slide to make things interesting. <laughs> so up here at the top, I've got the, uh, our view layer. Now, uh, this is using something that's known as the MVVM design pattern or model view view model. Totally not important to understand that. I'll describe what we need to know along the way. And this is obviously a desktop application in case you didn't figure that out. And that's because I love WPF and XAML. So this is our, uh, our view, which are our UI elements. So this is just kind of the controls, and you know they're, they're on the screen. Below that, we have our presentation layer, which is the view model in the MVVM design pattern. And this is responsible for the presentation logic. So these are the uh, methods and properties that we data bind to our UI in order to get uh, the view to actually display the data that it needs to display. Now below that, I have a repositories folder, and this is where we have our data access layer. So this is using something known as the repository pattern, and this is just a way that we can add a layer of abstraction between our data storage and the rest of our application. I don't want this part of my application to care about where the data is coming from. Shouldn't care that it's coming from a service or a, a, SQL, a SQL server or text file. All it cares about is, hey, there's some methods in here that I can use to get data. And then it's responsible for communicating with our actual data store, which is down here. In this case, it's a service. And this is a WCF SOAP service that we're using for our data. So let's go ahead and take a look at these different layers. And I'm just going to walk through them from the bottom layer all the way up to the top. So if I pop open the service, I have this service called people service, and let me go ahead and collapse the definitions. And I always have to give a warning during this part of the presentation, because this is going to seem very tedious. And to me, it seems very tedious. But the thing is, we have to get through this little bit of tedious so that the awesome is really awesome. So hang with me here, because I promise it'll be worth it or double your money back, okay? So here's our service. And we can see here it's called person service and it has a set of methods that are, are used to provide us with data. We're specifically gonna be looking at this get people method. This is the one that we're going to be using. And we can see this returns a list of person. And if we just take a look at what a person is, very simple class, it has a first name, a last name, a start date, and a rating. So that's just the shape of our data. And then if we look at this method itself, it's just providing us a hard-coded list. Okay, so 
It's not doing anything real exciting, not hitting a database or anything like that. Just giving me some hard-coded data that we can work with. So this is our service layer, the very bottom of our application that's providing us with the data. Now, right above that, we have the data access layer, which is our repository. So again, let me go ahead and collapse the definitions here. And we'll see that what we have here is a class called service repository. And it also has those data access methods in it. So we've got the get people method, get person, add person, update person, delete person, update people. So those are all the data access methods that we have. And in this case, you'll notice that I have a variable to hold the service proxy. So that's a reference to our service that we just looked at. And then inside my constructor, I'm doing up an instance of that proxy object. And then in the get people method, this is basically just acting as a pass through to the service. So again, this will just call service proxy dot get people, which will return that list of person. And then this is basically just going to pass that along. Now, that looks like an unnecessary layer right now, but we'll see how useful it can be a little bit later on. See you with me so far? So we've seen our service layer at the bottom. We've seen our repository, which is doing our data access. Our next layer up is going to be our presentation layer, which is in our view model. And so we'll come up here and take a look at our main window view model. And okay, let's go ahead and collapse the definitions here. And we'll just take a look at what we have. Let's expand this guy, this guy, and this guy right now. So this class is called Main Window View Model. And you'll notice that it implements an interface called iNotify Property Changed. If you've done desktop programming, either Windows Forms or WPF, that will look familiar. If you haven't, that's OK. This is basically a set of boilerplate code so that if something changes in our view model, we can notify the UI, hey, something's changed, so that it can update the data binding. So that's what that's there for, is to make the data binding work. Now, you'll notice that uh, I have a field for my service repository. So again, that class that we just looked at. And then in the constructor, I'm moving up an instance of that and assigning it to our field. And then I've got three things that I'm using to data bind to my UI. The first is this people property right here. So it's an iEnumerable of person. The idea behind this property is that this is data bound to the list box that's in our UI. So every time that property changes, our list box is going to change along with it. Now, the other things that I have here are really more complicated than I wish they were. And that's because I'm using something that's known as commanding in the WPF world. Now, you'll notice I have some regions collapsed here. And that's because kind of the built-in built -in way. It's not built-in. You've got to do all this stuff. The way to do commanding by default is by creating a command object and having a whole bunch of stuff that you probably don't care about. <laughs> and so that's why I have it collapsed in this region. But I have a command called refresh people command. And the important bit of it is this execute method. So whenever this command fires, this execute method will run. And you'll notice it'll call the get people method from our repository and then assign it to the people property that we had above. So this is how our people property would get populated. Now again, unfortunately, a little more complicated than I wish it were, but that's the way, that's the way things go sometimes. And then I also have a clear people command. And you'll notice here, I take that people property, just new up an empty list of person. So that'll have the effect of clearing out that people property, which in turn will clear out the list box in our UI. Does that make sense? Now, the reason I'm using commands here is because it's possible in WPF to data bind the command to a button on the UI. So because I want to use this data binding, we have these commands in place. So we've seen our service layer down at the bottom with the data access. Then we've got the repository on top, or I'm sorry, the service with our data storage, the repository with our data access, and then our presentation layer, our view model, which is providing our presentation logic. The very top, we have our view 
And again, this is our UI elements that we have. So let's take a look at this. Now for this, I've got XAML. And again, I love XAML. It's really cool. I'm not going to make you suffer through learning XAML, though, <laughs> if you don't already know it. Instead, what I'm going to do is just kind of show you a couple things in the UI. So this is the markup for the list box. And the important bit that we want to look at is right here. You'll notice I have this item source property. And it has a binding to a people property. So what this is saying is, hey, I want to be data bound to the people property. That's how I'm going to populate this list box. Now, we don't know people property on what object at this point, but at least it tells us what property we want to data bind to. And then we also have the buttons. So if I click on the refresh button, notice it has a command property which is data bound to the refresh people command. So again, that's, re that's referencing that command that we just looked at inside of our view model. And our clear button has a similar binding to the clear people command. Now, the one thing we need to do is figure out how do we match up our view and our view model. And there's about a half a dozen different ways of doing this. So if you're doing MVVM in your own world and you're not doing it this way, don't feel like you're doing it wrong. Because, like I said, there's quite a few different ways of doing it. This is the code behind for the form. And you can see here in the constructor, our main window, the name of our, our class, I'm newing up an instance of the main window view model. Okay, so again, that's the object that has the people property and the two commands that we want to use for data binding. And I'm assigning it to the data context of the window. Now, the way that data binding works in the WPF world is when I say, I want a data bind to the people property. It says, OK, what's my data context? <laughs> and so it'll, it'll, it's actually way more complex than I'm going to describe it. But in this case, it'll say, oh, you know what? My data context is this main window view model thing. So I'm going to look for the people property on that object. Same thing with the commands. I'm going to look for the refresh people command on this view model object. Does that make sense? <coughs> now, like I said, bit more complicated than we need for a one screen application. And if we run this again, we can think about everything that's going on. So I come over here and I'm going to click the button. Well, the button's command is data bound to the refresh people command that we have on our view model. The view model's refresh people command is going to call the get people method on our repository. The repository is going to call the get people method on our service. The service is going to return a collection of people object to the repository. The repository is going to return a collection of people person object to our view model. Our view model is going to assign that to the people property, which is data bound to our list box. And that all happens when we click the button. <sighs> now that deserves applause, right? <laughs> yeah, so like I said, a bit more complicated than we would normally like to see here. And in this case, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm feeling pretty good about this application when I first start looking at it because I have these different layers. So that makes me feel like I have good separation of concerns, right? Anything that has to do with data access is in this repository. Anything that has to do with UI elements on the screen is up here in the view. So I feel like I'm doing pretty good here. I've got good separation of concerns. My code is where it belongs in each of these different sections in my code. But this code is actually hiding a really dirty secret. That dirty secret is tight coupling. Did you guys see it? No, you completely missed it? Let me show you the tight coupling that I'm talking about. Beep. And for this, I'm going to start at the top of our application, our view, and work my way back down. Now, one thing you'll notice is in the constructor for this view, our main window, I'm newing up an instance of the main window view model. Whenever we new stuff up, there's a couple different things that happen. First of all, I have to have a compile time reference to whatever project this main window view model lives in. Otherwise, this won't build. The second thing is, whenever I new something up, 
I am now taking responsibility for the lifetime of that object. Oh, is that something I really want? I don't. In fact, I'm going to refer to Steve Smith, who has an excellent article on this, which is actually linked in the notes for this, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so Steve Smith, uh, try to look him up online. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> if you're looking for him, he's known as Ar Ardalis online, A-R-D-A-L-I-S. So Steve Smith has this awesome article that's, that says, new is glue. And I love that, new is glue. Whenever I'm using the new keyword, I have just glued these pieces together, whether I like it or not. And uh, again, we're see we see that we have tight coupling. We haven't necessarily seen that it's a problem yet. So based on having the new between our view and our view model, we're seeing that I do have tight coupling between these two layers in my application. Now, it does actually get a little worse because if I click into the constructor of my view model, you'll notice that I'm newing up an instance of the service repository, our data access layer. So we have the same thing. New is glue. I need a compile time reference to that service repository. I've now taken responsibility for the lifetime of that, uh, of that object. OK. Um, so our view model is tightly coupled to our repository. And it actually gets a little worse, because if I go into the constructor of my repository, we see that I'm newing up an instance of the proxy that's pointing to our production service. Now, this actually doesn't worry me a whole lot, because really, my data access and my data storage, they kind of need to know about each other. So this doesn't bother me as much, but the side effects do, because our repository is tightly coupled to our service. And if we look at what we have here, <laughs> since our view is tightly coupled to our view model, our view model is tightly coupled to our repository, and our repository is tightly coupled to our service, that actually means that our view is tightly coupled to our service. Does that scare anybody? <laughs> Again, in this one screen application, maybe not. But when I see something like that, it really starts to worry me. And you know why it worries me? It worries me because of my boss. Does anyone here have a boss? <laughs> yeah. So my boss comes up to me and says, Jeremy, this is a really awesome application. I like what you've done with it. Right? I mean, look at this. You click the button, gets data out of the service, displays it on the screen. But. Yeah, everybody that I know has a big butt, right? My boss has a big butt. My boss says, but not all of our clients store their data in services. Some of them want to use SQL Server to get their data. Some of them want to use Oracle. Some of them want to use AWS or another cloud provider. Some of them want to use Hadoop or another uh, NoSQL database. Some of them just want to use a text file on the local machine because they don't even want to make a network connection. Okay, so I start to think about that, and you know, I'm kind of really paying attention to my, my view model here. Let me go to my view model. Because I'm looking at this constructor here, and I'm saying, okay, well, maybe I can add a switch statement here. And you know, based on configuration, I can new up a service repository, or I can new up a SQL repository, or I can new up a CSV repository or a Hadoop, or an Oracle, or whatever. I'm like, that's doable, right? But my boss isn't done. He says, and <laughs> because that network call is kind of the most expensive part of this application, we'd like to institute a client-side cache. But only if the client wants the client-side cache. I'm thinking, OK, well, I guess I can create a service repository and a caching service repository and a SQL repository, and a caching SQL repository, and a CSV repository, and a caching CSV repository. And that switch statement's starting to look a lot nastier at this point in time. And we want to have unit testing here. Specifically, I want to have unit testing in my view model. Okay, So this is what we're going to concentrate on. Well, actually, we'll see unit testing in a couple different places in this application. Now, that's something I agree with my boss on. I want unit testing here. But 
The problem with unit testing in its current form with this particular application is let's say I want to make sure that when I execute this refresh people command that my people property gets populated. That's a pretty basic thing that I want to check. Then I might want to check if someone calls the clear command that it clears it out. Okay, so those are pretty basic things that I'd want to check for my view model. Now the problem is if I go to my unit test and I say new main window view model, I'm also going to get a new service repository, which is also going to give me a new person service client, a connection to my production SOAP service. And what that means is that if my service isn't running, my unit test on my view model is going to fail. Well, that's bad. I'm not testing my service here. I want to test the view model. Okay, then I start thinking about, okay, well, that's not a problem because I've got this protected field, right? So that means that I can crack this thing open, use a little bit of reflection code, pull out the real thing and put in a fake one. That'll be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not great because now my unit tests are 30 lines long. If you have unit tests that are 30 lines long, nobody's going to write them. And if something breaks on them, nobody's going to fix them. They're just going to comment them out. So really our goal should have be code that's easy to read and unit tests that are easy to read. And in our current state, we've got some problems with that. So does anyone have any ideas of how we might fix some of those problems? Distraction. Nobody at all? It's actually in the title of the presentation. <laughs> We're going to use some dependency injection to fix this. <laughs> it's been a long day, hasn't it? Yeah. User groups are always fun because like, OK, we've had a full day of like working for a real boss, and now we have to come and listen to this stuff. Now, I'm actually going to open up another project that I have here, which is in the same state as the one we just looked at, but it's actually got some additional projects in here that we'll be using as we go. So. Uh, I'll just pop these folders open and we can look at them. Roop. Come on. You can do it. So I've got uh, actually a couple different projects with uh, using some containers that we'll look at later. But this people viewer project, that's the same view project we were just looking at. In our repositories, I have the person service or person repository dot service, same repository there with a couple of other stuff. Got the same service and the same uh, presentation, our same view model. So it's the same stuff we are looking at, plus a couple others. Now again, we're going to be concentrating on our view model. So let's go ahead and open that guy up and ask ourselves a couple questions about this guy. And this is something where I'm going to talk about the single responsibility principle because that's good. Oh, cool. This is actually a simplified version. This actually doesn't use um, commanding. It uses a different way of getting the <laughs> data. I updated one of my projects, but not the other, apparently. So rather than having the command with all that extra code, I just have a refresh people method. <laughs> it's actually a lot easier to read. I have to remember that update that other project that we just looked at. So, uh, but I have the same field, our service repository, and I'm still newing it up inside of our view model. And I want to break this tight coupling here. And one of the reasons why is I want to ask myself, what's the responsibility for this class? Now, in this case, this is my view model. So its responsibility is really presentation logic. Its responsibility should not be deciding what data store I'm using. So my view model shouldn't care whether I'm using a service repository or a CSV repository or a SQL repository. That's not its job to care. All it should care about is, hey, how do I get data to and from my UI? That's really what its job is. So that's what we're going to try to get rid of. Now, the first thing that I want to do is I want to get rid of this reference to the service repository that I have up here. And for that, I'm going to use an interface. Now, I love interfaces. In fact, I have an entire Pluralsight course on interfaces <laughs> because it's another one of those things that was difficult for me to learn but became extremely useful. Now, if you're not familiar with interfaces, basically what we can do is create a contract 
that says a class must have these methods. And then we can program against that contract rather than programming against a particular type. So I actually have that interface already set up. I think down here, there we go. So you'll notice that I have a repository, or I'm sorry, an iPerson repository interface, and it has the methods get people, get person, add person, update person, delete person, update people. So it has those same data access methods that we were looking at before. But if you'll notice, these are just declarations. So there's no method implementation here, just declarations. And so when we have a class that implements this interface, what we're saying is, I solemnly swear that I will have these six methods in it. And because we have that contract, we can program against this interface, the abstraction, rather than a co the concrete type itself. Now, if I go to my service repository, I've actually already noted that this implements the iPerson repository interface. And that's actually pretty easy to say because the way I got that interface was to extract it from this class. <laughs> and Visual Studio is awesome at that because all you have to say is right click on the class and um, oh, actually let's go to our refactorings and we have extract interface. And it says, hey, what do you want to put in the interface? What do you want to call it? Where do you want to <laughs> what um, file name should it have? So it's really easy to generate an interface just like that. And that's actually what I did to generate that separate class, or I'm sorry, the separate file with the interface in it. And then this guy, since we pulled it out of here, he has those six methods. Now what that means is that I can change the type of my field that I have inside my view model. So rather than this field being a service repository, I can make it an iPerson repository. And this will work exactly the same as it, as it did before. So I can build this. Come on, you can do it. And I can run it. And this will still work. Think. Ta-da, just like that. And the reason for that is because our service repository does implement this interface. So I'm allowed to assign it to this particular, uh, to this particular uh, field that I have. So that kind of loosens our coupling a little bit, but I want to really get rid of that new. I don't want my view model to be responsible for figuring this stuff out. Someone else should be responsible for it. Now, I do need a repository. I have a dependency on it. Why? Because I need to call the get people method on my repository. That's something I have to do. So I need this, but I don't want to deal with it myself. So whenever I come across a situation where I kind of don't want to deal with a problem, I just make it somebody else's problem. That sound like a good solution? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this somebody else's problem. I don't want to have to figure out what concrete type, what repository to new up. So what I'm going to say is whoever creates this class has to provide me with an already uh, instantiated repository. So I'm just adding a constructor parameter that says, OK, when you knew this up, give me a repository along with that, because I need it, because I need to call that get people method. I have just done dependency injection. <laughs> yeah, I know it looks like a constructor parameter, but that's the point. It doesn't have to be difficult. In fact, this is what's known as constructor injection, because we have a dependency. We're injecting it into our class through the constructor. That's all it is. It doesn't have to be complicated. We don't have to think about this big mess. It's a constructor parameter. <laughs> and now I'm doing constructor injection. That was easy, right? Now, of course, in everyday speech, when you're talking to your boss especially, you want to say you're using constructor injection, because that sounds a lot more impressive than to say I'm using a, I have a parameter on my constructor. <laughs> OK, so problem solved, right? OK, let's go ahead and build and run our application. Do, 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 do. Oh, there's kind of a failure. OK, fine. Let's click in, see what the problem is. Oh, OK. Well, the problem is in my view, because I'm newing up an instance of the main window view model. And at this point, it's saying, hey, you don't have a no parameter constructor anymore. OK, well, I could come in here. 
you know, and create a repository. But if it's not the job of my view model to figure out what data store we're using, it's really not the job of my view to figure that out. So this wouldn't be a good place to do that. So what should I do? I'm going to make it somebody else's problem. So I'm going to say whoever gives me this main window object must also give me a main window view model. Oh, not new. View model. So whoever creates this main window class must give me an already instantiated main window view model. Now you'll notice I'm not using an interface here like I did with the uh, repository. And that's because in my experience, generally my views and view models are one-to-one -one relationships. If I do need to have multiple view models that can be used with this view, I'll go ahead and add the interface so that I have that abstraction. I can swap things out, be a little more flexible. But I'm a really big fan of adding abstraction when I need it and not before. Because every time I add abstraction, every time I add a layer of indirection, I've just made my code more difficult to navigate, more difficult to debug. And if I'm not actually getting the benefits out of that, I'm just making my code harder. <laughs> so I want to think about the abstractions I might want in the future, but I don't actually add them until I'm ready to use them. And I have an entire talk called Abstract Art, which is about finding the right level of abstraction <laughs> in your code which is also a Pluralsight course if you're interested. I'm going to tell you about all of my Pluralsight courses before the night is done. So I've mentioned three so far. There's four more to mention. <laughs> oh, like name dropping? Yeah, name dropping. Well, the more people that watch them, the more money I get. <laughs> so <clears throat> I've just made this somebody else's problem. Let's go ahead and build. Build my application. Oh, build succeeded. Awesome. Time to run. OK, uh, let me just be sure. I'm going to do like a full clean and rebuild just to make sure. OK, let's go ahead and run our application. Oh, <laughs> I, I got a runtime error now. That's great, isn't it? And notice the code that it's pointing at. It's not pointing at any code. <laughs> Now, this is something that's new in Visual Studio 2015 Update 2. This is awesome. I love how Visual Studio keeps getting better. Now, before Update 2, the error message that you get here is a null reference exception that simply says, object not set to instance of an object. You know, everybody's favorite error message. But starting in Visual Studio 2015 Update 2, we got this amazing box. It's actually telling me that this is a XAML parse exception. Now, anyone who's done enough XAML programming and has gotten the blank screen, they know there's a problem in the XAML, <laughs> even if you get that null reference exception. But now Visual Studio actually tells you there's a XAML problem. And in fact, it's even better because it tells you what the problem is. Because if we zoom in on this, it'll say no matching constructor found on peopleviewer.mainwindow. Ooh, I just changed the constructor on our main window. So this is actually telling me where the problem is. And that is so much better than simply getting that null reference <laughs> exception. So I changed the constructor. That kind of implies that I have to change something somewhere else too, right? So let's go ahead and stop debugging. And I'm going to show you where this error is coming from. Because inside my people viewer project, since this is a WPF application, I have the application object. So just like in a WinForms application, we have an application and a console application, we have program. We have an application object inside of our WPF application. We'll ignore these resources because that's all about styling. And we'll just look at this top part here. This represents the application itself. And you'll notice this startup URI right here. It says mainwindow.xaml. So that's saying when the application starts, you're going to show the mainwindow.xaml. And what it tries to do is it tries to create one of these objects using a no parameter constructor. Well, I don't have a no parameter constructor because I just added a constructor parameter. So that's why we're getting that runtime error. Now, whenever I run across a piece of code that's causing me a problem, I just delete it. 
right? So we'll just delete it. We'll rebuild. OK, build succeeded. That's good. OK, let's go ahead and run our application. Bam! No runtime errors. My application is successfully running right now. You guys don't seem impressed. OK, so there's no main window, but there's no runtime errors. <laughs> So step forward, maybe. OK. This is a tough room. So <laughs> just like our XAML has code behind when we're talking about our forms, our application XAML also has code behind. So that means that we can take a little bit more control over this. So I'm just going to pop open the code behind for this. And you can see <laughs> I've got a method already prepared. This is an override of the onStartup method that we have on our application object. Now, this is what it's trying to do when we use that startup URI tag. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to new up the main window class with a no parameter constructor. Then it's going to assign it to the main window property of the application. And then it's going to show that window. Now, you'll notice by the red squigglies, this is not happy. <laughs> And that's, of course, why we were getting those runtime errors. So let's try to figure out what's going on here. OK, so our main window, what does it want? OK, well, it wants a view model. OK, so let's go ahead and create a view model. And we'll new up the main window view model. And then we'll just pass that in right here. OK, that looks pretty good. OK, my main window view model, what does it want? Well, it wants an iPerson repository. OK, well, let me go ahead and create one of those. So we'll say var repository equals new service repository. And we'll just pass that in right there. Have you figured out what we're doing yet? <laughs> That's the technical term. So <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm taking my loosely coupled pieces and I'm snapping them together. That's all I'm doing. Because you've got to put them together somewhere. You can't just have these loose pieces floating around. You've got to snap them together somewhere. And this is what's known as the composition root. And if I run my application at this point, what we'll see is that we have exactly the same functionality that we had 20 minutes ago. That is really discouraging. <laughs> After all that work, we have exactly the same thing that we had before. But we are actually in a much, much better situation than we were in before. So uh, let's just be a little more obvious that this is our composition root. I'm going to extract out this method. Just going to hit control dot, choose extract method, and I'm going to call this compose objects, since that's what I'm doing here. OK, so now that we have this application in place, that is theoretically more loosely coupled than what we had before. Let's go back and think about what our boss, boss wanted. OK, do you remember what the first thing my boss wanted for our clients? Different repositories. Different repositories, yeah. Not all of our clients use a, a SOAP service. So in this case, I want to swap this out for one that just uses a text file that's on the file system. Well, guess what? In my repositories folder, I've already got one of those in personrepository.csv. So let's go ahead and take a look at this class that I already have. I'll just collapse the definitions. So I have a class called CSV repository. It implements that same interface iPerson repository, which means it has those six methods, get people, get person, add person, update person, delete person, update people. So that means from my view model's perspective, this is going to plug right in because all my view model cares about is that interface, iPerson repository. It doesn't care about the concrete type, which is really awesome. I love that. OK, and then if we look at what this is actually doing, it's a little more complex. So what it's going to do is it's going to get the file name out of configuration. It wants to know what file name we're going to use. It assumes that the file's in the same folder as our executable. And then if we look at the get people method, rather than just acting as a pass through like our service repository did, 
we can see that this is actually cracking open that file using a stream reader against it, separating it, splitting it on commas because it's a comma separated values file, turning it into person objects, and then returning that collection of, of uh, people. So it's doing something completely different from our service repository. But because it implements the same interface, our application doesn't care. Do you want to see how hard it is to use this in our application? You ready? So I'm going to go back to my composition root and snap my blocks together in a different order. So instead of using the service repository, I'm going to use the CSV repository. And I already have the assemblies and using statements in here. I run my application. And now when I click the button, I'm getting data from a text file rather than a SOAP service. And I know that because my text file has an extra record, Jeremy Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I can tell just by looking at the data that I'm getting this from somewhere else. Now that's starting to look kind of cool. <laughs> Because to use this repository, did I have to change my view model? No. Did I have to change my view? No. Did I have to change any existing repositories? No. All I had to do was snap my pieces together in a different order. That is really cool. I don't think you realize how cool that is. <laughs> I get a little overexcited about this stuff, <laughs> in case you haven't figured it out yet. Are you going to touch on anything about how you might so what was the second thing my boss wanted? Caching. Caching. Yeah. OK, let's look at that. <laughs> now, for caching, I'm going to use something that's known as the decorator pattern. Now, what the decorator pattern does is, let's say I have an interface. Oh, let's say an iPerson repository. This is what it looks like to the outside world. When I use the decorator pattern, what I'm going to do is have another class that wraps this repository and then exposes the same interface to the outside world. So to the outside world, it will look just like every other repository, but it can inject its own functionality in between. So let me show you what that looks like. And in fact, I have in my repositories folder a project called personrepository.caching. And I've got a caching repository here. Let's go ahead and collapse the definitions. And we'll take a look at this. So it's called caching repository. And again, it implements iPerson repository. So to the outside world, it looks just like every other repository. But if we look in our constructor, we'll notice that I'm taking an iPerson repository as a parameter here. So this is the real repository that I want to get my data out of, whether it's the service repository or the CSV repository. So basically, I'm saying, hey, give me a real repository, and then I'm going to hang on to a reference to that in this field. And then the rest of this code is dealing with the cache. And I can basically talk about this just by talking about these properties, or I'm sorry, these are fields that we have at the top of our screen. So here's my real repository, which I'm calling wrapped repository. And then I also have an ienumerable of persons, so a collection of person objects called cached items. So this is going to represent my client side cache. So if that is empty, if someone calls get people, I'm going to call the real repository, populate my cached items. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to update this data date timed property field. Field, not property. It's a field. <laughs> and so then the next time someone asks for the get people method or calls the get people method, it's going to say, OK, is the cached items populated? OK, it's populated. How old is the data by looking at the data date time? And in this case, I have a cache duration, which is 30 seconds. So it's going to say, if this data is more than 30 seconds old, I'm going to go back to the real repository and refresh it. If it's less than 30 seconds old, I'm just going to give you what I already have in memory without hitting that real repository. Does that make sense? It's pretty cool. I won't walk through the rest of the code because it's not that good. <laughs> but it does work. <laughs> I would do this a lot differently now. Now, if you are interested in kind of a deep dive into this caching repository, I have a Pluralsight course, <laughs> which is called Design Patterns on Ramp. And that's all about design patterns. And one of the patterns that I talk about is actually the decorator pattern. And I use exactly the same example. And it actually walks through how this invalidation of the cache and everything works. 
Um, one other thing that I did discover while doing that course is that cache duration is a really bad name for anything you have to say out loud. Because if you say it over and over again, cache duration, cache duration, cache duration. <laughs> By the time I figured that out, I was too far along in editing. I'm like, it's going to stay in there. I'm not going to change that. <laughs> so yes, I do say cache duration quite a few times during that particular module. <sighs> the things we learn. <laughs> OK, so that's our caching repository. How do we use this? Well, all we're going to do is we're going to snap our pieces together in a different order. So I'm going to go back to my composition root. And instead of using the CSV repository, I'm going to use the caching repository. And again, this actually wants an iPerson repository that it can wrap. OK, and I'm going to use the service repository here just because it's going to be easier to demonstrate. So I'm going to call this wrapped repository equals new service repository. And then I'll just pass that in. So I'm taking my loosely coupled pieces and snapping them together in a different order. Now I, have a now I have an application that's going to use a WCF SOAP service to get data from, but it also has a 30-second client-side cache. OK, you guys don't believe me. Fine, I'll show you that it has a 30-second client-side cache. So we're going to run our application. I'm going to click the button. We'll get our data from the SOAP service. And uh, again, there's no Jeremy Awesome, so we know we're coming from the service. I'm going to come up here to my IIS Express, which is where my service is running, and I'm going to exit out of that. So with that, my service is no longer running. But I can click Clear Data and refresh, and I still have data because it's uh, using the client-side cache. Now after 30 seconds, my cache is going to expire, and that 30 seconds, OK, there, we hit our 30-second cache. <laughs> So when it expires, it's going to go try to communicate with the service, which is no longer running. And it won't find it. It'll time out. So I have the caching repository set up. So if it can't communicate with the wrapped service, with the wrapped repository, it just returns no data available. So we just saw the client side cache worked because we turned off our service and we still had data for a while. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And I could show you exactly the same thing with the text file. We could go in, uh, pull data from the text file, delete the text file, use that client-side cache until it tries to hit the text file again. That's pretty cool. Now this is starting to look really cool, isn't it? Because let's think about this. To add caching functionality, did I have to change my view? No. Did I have to change my view model? No. Did I have to change any of my existing repositories? No. I'm just snapping my pieces together in a different order. Now, it's not all puppies and unicorns because I do have some things in place. So for example, in this application where my, um, where my app.xaml is, my app.xaml CS is, I do have references to all of those different DLLs that we're referencing. So I've got the caching repository, the CSV repository, the service repository. So I actually do have compile time references to those. And then if I look at my app.config file, this will show us that I have some configuration for my repositories in place. So right here, I have an app setting for the CSV file name, people.txt. So again, it's just looking for that text file in the same um, folder as the executable. And then going against the service, here's a system.service model section. And that tells us here's the location where you're going to find that service. So there is some configuration in place, and we do have those compile time references. But um, other than that, it's really, really easy to do. I really love that. So we've made our, happy, our boss happy twice so far. What was the third thing my boss wanted? Testing? Is that what I heard? Yeah, unit testing. Let's see how easy it is to unit test this view model now that we have this um, loose coupling in place. Let's close a bunch of these. <laughs> Let's go ahead and do close all but this so we have our view model open. That's not my view model. <laughs> okay, fine. Be that way. Uh, go to definition. That's my view model. Okay. 
So again, this is my view model, and this is what I actually want to test to start with. And we're actually going to test our repository as well. So again, I'm, I don't have much going on here, so our tests are going to be pretty simple. Again, the things I want to test is I want to make sure if I call the refresh people method that my people property should be populated, because that's what this code is supposed to do. Also, if I call the clear people method, I would expect that my people property will be cleared out and empty. So those are two things that I want to verify uh, in my unit tests. So for this, I have some tests already set up. <coughs> so if we scroll all the way down to our presentation tests, and then just so, let me collapse some of these. Okay. The way that I name my unit tests goes along with the projects and classes that they're testing. And I have, I don't have a Pluralsight course, but <laughs> I do have another talk where I talk extensively about unit testing and TDD and some other things. So what I do is my test project name is the same name as the project that I'm testing. So since I'm testing the peopleviewer.presentation project, my test project is called peopleviewer.presentation.tests. And since I'm testing the main window view model class, my test class is called main window view model tests. So that way um, I can stay pretty well organized when I'm looking at these different things. Now the reason that this is commented out is because these tests were expecting to go uh, to have that interface, which we added earlier. So this code wouldn't have compiled when uh, we just first started. So I'm going to uncomment this, and then we'll take a look at what we have in here. Bloop. OK. So this first test, like I said, when I call that refresh people method, I expect that my people property is going to be populated. And in fact, I name my tests the same uh, in a way so that I know what they're doing just by looking at the names of the tests. So I'm actually using a three-part naming scheme. And this is one that's recommended by Roy Osherov, but there's several different naming schemes you can use. So the first part of the name is the unit under test. So what am I testing? I'm testing the refresh people method. The second part is whatever action I'm performing. Well, in this case, I'm just executing the method. I don't have any special parameters or anything. And then the third part is my expected outcome. So in this case, I'm expecting the people property is populated. So what's good about this is if I'm looking at my test runner and this test fails, I can tell just by the name what it's trying to do. I would highly recommend that, by the way. But notice how simple my test is. Because all I have to do is new up my main window view model and pass in a repository. We'll take a look at where that comes from in just a bit. And then I call the refresh people method. And then I have some assertions. I make sure my people property is not null. And I make sure it has two items in it because we have two test items, which we'll look at in just a bit. So I don't have 30 lines of reflection code in here. I have five lines of code in the test. That means that I will write these tests all day long because they're easy to write. If something goes wrong, I'll be able to figure out, is the test the problem because my business logic has changed, or is my code the problem? and go in and fix it because I can see really easily what it's doing. If I have a bunch of reflection code in here, I'm going to get lost in that and have no idea what's going on. So let's see what happens when I call this get test repository. What am I doing here? Well, in this case, all I need is something that implements that iPerson repository interface. And I don't need it to hit a real service or a real file. I can just use an in-memory object. Now, in this case, I'm using a mocking framework called mock -Q, spelled M-O-Q. There's a lot of mocking frameworks out there. I'm not here to teach you how to do mocking, <laughs> but I'll show you how this works. So first I have two test records. So these are just the records that I want to use in my tests. So I have a variable called people, which is a list of person with these two items in it. Then I use my mock, and I say, I would like a mock object on the iPerson repository. So please create an in-memory representation of this interface and it basically gives me default values for anything I don't care about. <laughs> now remember, our interface has six different methods in it. I don't have to create those six methods. I can just go ahead and tell it what to do for the one method I actually care about in this case, which is the getPeople method. 
Now again, I won't describe the whole details here, but basically what I'm saying in this setup is I'm saying if somebody calls the get people method on this mock object, please return them the people collection, which again, these two objects right here. So that's what it's telling us. And then this guy gets returned as the iPerson repository. And that's this guy right here. So I call that method, get my mock repository, pass it in as a parameter to my view model, and away I go. And again, I can look for two items, because I have two items in my test data. Does that make sense? Really easy to write, really easy to read. Now, our clear test is a little more complicated. And that's just because our arrangement needs to be a little more complicated. So I do the same thing. I get that fake repository. And then I new up a main window view model, passing in that mock object. But before I perform my clear, I actually call refresh. Now the reason I do this is I want to make sure that the people property gets cleared out when I call the clear people method. Now when I first start up this, um, when I first create a new instance of this view model, the people property is going to be empty. That's the way it starts out. So I actually want to put something into it first to make sure that the clear method is actually working. So in this case, I call the refresh people method, and then I do a little sanity check to make sure that there's two items in there. And this is all in my arrange section. So if I get to here, I've got two items in my people property. I'm ready to test my clear. Then I just call clear people, make sure there's zero items in there. Again, when the tests are this easy to write, I'm going to write them all day long. And that's really cool. I really like unit testing. <laughs> I get overexcited about unit testing as well. So are, are there any questions on what we've seen there? So you guys either completely have it or you're just tired and want to go to bed. One of the two. Do you want to see another pattern? Sure. Okay, three people would like to see another pattern. So we've seen constructor injection. And constructor injection is awesome because it forces someone to make a decision. When I new up this main window view model, I have to give you a repository. I have to pick one. That's the only way I can satisfy that constructor parameter. What I'm going to show you now is uh, known as property injection. And this is really useful if we have a good default value. So 99% of the time, I would like you to use this. But I would like the option to swap that out. That's what property injection is really good for. And for that, we're going to look at uh, some other unit tests. Do you guys believe me that these tests actually work? <laughs> Let's go ahead and build. And we're actually going to get five tests. Oh, there's our two tests from here. Boop. Do, 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 do. Two passing tests. <laughs> Yay. OK, so we're actually going to look at these three tests now. <laughs> because in addition to our view model, I want to test my repository. Now, my service repository is a pretty simple class. Again, it's not that complex. And in this case, <laughs> Since it's acting as a pass-through, all I want this to say is, you know what? When I ask for a collection from the get people method on the service, it should come unmodified through, and I'm just going to pass it straight through to whoever's on the other side of that. So my test is just going to make sure that what I get out of this get people method on my repository is the same thing that I'm getting out of the get people method on the service itself. But I don't want to rely on the production service for my tests. Because again, if that, test, if that service isn't running, I don't want the tests on my repository to fail. So I want to isolate this. And I'm going to use something that's known as property injection. Now, one thing you'll notice is this class is a little bit different from the one that I showed you earlier. You'll notice there's no constructor. OK. Well, how does that service proxy property get populated? Well, this is actually a really cool construct. The first time I saw this, I'm like, that's ingenious. <laughs> I like that. Let me show you what we've got here. Specifically, I want to look at the getter for this particular property. So in the getter, the first thing it does is it checks the backing field of the property. If the backing field is null, then it's actually going to new up 
a connection to that production service. Now, if it's not null, it's just going to return us whatever's in that backing field. So what that means is if I do nothing, it's going to use the production service. Let me show you what I mean by that. So let's scroll down a little bit and look at the get people method. OK, so let's say that I knew up this class and I, or uh, yeah, so I knew it up in my composition root. Now I'm ready to use it. And I call the get people method on it. Well, it's going to say, OK, well, get me this service proxy property. OK, it's going to come up here and it's going to say, OK, is the service proxy prop, uh, backing field null? Well, yes, it is, because this is a brand new object. Nothing's been initialized yet. And it says, OK, let me go ahead and new up a connection to our production service. And then I'll give that back to you. And then we can call the get people method on the production service. Now, if I happen to call get people uh, again, it's going to say, OK, get me the service proxy. OK, is the backing field null? No, it's already populated. So let me just go ahead and give you that back. And then we can call the get people method on that. So again, if I do nothing, I use the production service. But I have the option of swapping this out. So let's say in my unit tests, which I'll show you in just a second, I create an instance of the service repository class. Before I make any method calls, I set the service proxy property. And I can set it to a mock or a fake object that I want to use for testing. Now, when I say, OK, give me the service proxy, it's going to say, is the backing field null? No, it's not, because it's filled in with this fake object. And it's just going to give me the fake object back that I can then call get people. So if I do nothing, it's going to use the production service. But I have the option of swapping this out before I make any calls. I see that quizzical look. Uh, have you formed the question yet, or is it still forming? Just a mix of thoughts around there's no, we can't inject anything into that default and thread safety around calling get people multiple times if the construction for whatever reason is a little bit longer. There's, there's other concerns around that. You could probably go around it. There are, there are concerns in that. And in, in whenever you start doing multi-threading, you have concerns full stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that even includes the stuff that uh, stuff's running in in my constructors. <laughs> so um, yeah, and there's obviously a drawback here, which is anybody can go in and set this property in code. <laughs> but it's not real obvious that it's there unless you're looking for it. Uh, but let's take a look at the test for this. And again, all of these, just like everything else that we have in our toolbox, all of these patterns have pros and cons. And we have to weigh the benefits and drawbacks before we figure out what we want to use. I lean towards constructor injection because it's very obvious what I have to do. I have to provide this already instantiated object, otherwise my code doesn't build. With property injection, things are a little bit more hidden because I have the option of doing nothing, which again is good if I have a default value that I want to use most of the time. And then when you start talking about service locator and ambient context and method injection, same kind of things. They all kind of have their pros and cons. So let's take a look at this test, these tests to see how this works. Now, one thing that we'll notice is I have this get test service method, and this looks very similar to that get test repository method that we looked at earlier. So again, I've got this list of two fake people objects that I want to use for testing. I have my mock object, but now I'm mocking up the iPerson service. So I'm mocking up the service, not the repository. And then same kind of thing. If someone calls the get people method, please give them back this uh, people object here. And in fact, I have to do two array because it's doing arrays rather than lists. And then here's actually something that's a little more complicated to get an individual person, which I'm totally not going to describe. <laughs> but mocking is really cool. <laughs> so I'm creating this mock object in memory. And here's how our tests look. So here's our first test. So get people method on execute returns people, right? So we're expecting we'll get those same two records that are coming from our fake service. So I new up an instance of my service repository. 
And again, there's no constructor parameters on this. But before I do any action, I set that proxy property to my fake object. So I'm swapping that out saying, please use this fake object. And then when I call get people, it's so going to end up calling get people on my test object. So again, I should have two items. My output should not be null. Does that make sense? So you'll notice these tests are already passing because I ran them when we ran the other tests. Just to kind of show what happens if we don't override, I'm going to comment out that line of code that's setting the property. And now I'm going to rerun my tests. And one of them fails, <laughs> which really isn't that big of a surprise since I intentionally broke it. Now let's take a look at the error message that we have from this. So the error message that we have is it's actually saying that I don't have a system.service model section in configuration. And again, it's trying to access that production SOAP service. And it's going to say, you really should have a configuration item that tells me what URL this is pointing at. Now, I don't have that in my test project, so it blows up. So I can tell it's trying to use my production service if I don't do anything special. But again, all I have to do, override that with my fake value. Rerun my tests. Now it's using that mock object that I have in memory. That's actually pretty cool. Now there are a couple other ways of doing property injection. Um, and the only reason I'm going to point this out is because um, I, I mentioned Roy Osherov before. He wrote this excellent book called The Art of Unit Testing with Examples in C Sharp. Excellent book. It's only about this big. And um, he actually shows a slightly different way of doing property injection. What he does is he actually still has a constructor and he news up the default value in the constructor so that it will always get created at startup. But then again, you have the freedom to go in and use the setter to swap it out. Now that works in a lot of situations, but it doesn't work here. The reason it doesn't work here is because if I try to new up this person service client, and there's no system.service model, there's no actual service running on a URL somewhere, that's going to fail. And so in this situation, I don't want to new it up at all. And I actually ran into this exact same scenario. I have an article that's uh, linked with these, uh, which is called Property Injection Simple versus Safe, which actually compares those two methodologies. I actually ran into this because I was doing some home automation software that expected uh, a dongle to be plugged into my computer. <laughs> Tells you how old my hardware is. <laughs> so it's expecting that a serial dongle is plugged into the computer. And so it's looking to communicate on COM3. Who here is old enough to remember COM3? <laughs> yeah. So the problem is, is if that piece of hardware is not plugged in and, my, um, and your machine goes looking for COM3, it's going to blow up. It's going to say, hey, COM3 doesn't exist. So what I want to do is not have it ever look for COM3. Instead, I'm going to say, hey, use this fake repository, not using a real COM port. It's just kind of, in that case, it's actually just kind of eating the commands because it really doesn't care about what's on the other side. So there's situations where we don't want to new them up because just the act of newing them up causes problems. And in that case, this way of doing property injection works really well. If it's OK to new up the default object, even if we don't use it, then we can do it in a, a different way as well. So one thing to keep in mind is that constructor injection, property injection, and the other patterns that we have, they are patterns. And what that means is there's more than one implementation. And we're free to use the implementation that we need for our particular environment. So I'm showing you one implementation here. You can go to my website, read about, the other, uh, read about another implementation, and there could potentially be others as well. That makes sense? So I've managed to make it through like a full hour without talking about dependency injection containers at all. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Now, the reason, again, that I do this is because it's important to understand the concepts that are underlying this so that now we can use the containers more effectively. 
I'm not going to discourage you from using a container. I just want you to understand what it's doing so that it doesn't look like magic. You want to see a container? Oh, that's not very enthusiastic. <laughs> well, I guess if we have to. OK, fine. <laughs> so I actually have a couple other projects set up here. Now, the way that I have this set up, go ahead and just collapse these guys, is we're going to be looking at different view projects. So I actually have, this is the one that we've been doing where we've manually been composing our objects with our composition root. And then I have some set up to use Ninject Unity, and then I also have a late binding example that we'll look at. So um, these applications actually use the rest of the uh, projects that we've been looking at. So it uses the same view models, uses the same uh, repositories, the same data stores, et cetera, et cetera. So basically only the top parts have changed. And um, I'll talk about how you could separate this out one more way, but later. <laughs> Remind me to do that. So let's look at Ninject. The reason I like Ninject is because the syntax is really easy to use. So um, the, two, the, um, the two containers that I've worked with personally are Ninject and Unity. So that's what I'm going to show you. But again, the other ones have pretty much the same functionality, just different ways of approaching it. So we'll go ahead and set our startup project to Ninject. And we'll take a look at what we have in our app.xaml.cs. So this is where we had our composition root in our other application. And apparently, I need to fill some stuff in. <laughs> this application is not going to work very well right now. So to use Ninject, I've already brought in the, uh, you, can get the you can get Ninject through NuGet. So I've already brought all that in. I've already added the assembly references. So at the top, I have a using statement for, OK, I don't. In a moment, I will have a using statement for using Ninject. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, oh, not there, is I'm going to create a class level field that I'm going to use to represent my dependency injection container. And I'm going to reference this through the interface, which in the world of Ninject is known as a kernel. So I'm going to create a variable which is of type ikernel. And you'll notice I'm not getting IntelliSense in that, and that's because I haven't brought in that using statement yet. And I'm a lazy developer. Who here is a lazy developer? OK, that's a lot of you, because real lazy developers don't raise their hands. Um, so I'm going to type in ikernel, and I'm just going to hit control dot. Come on, control dot. Oh, come on, control dot. Oh, really? Uh, maybe I didn't bring in. Uh, Ninject is not there. OK, apparently I was going to do this the full way and show you how to do the <laughs> bring in <laughs> the NuGet package. Let me turn on my internet. <laughs> Fine. That's not ready for me yet. Aren't you glad, glad I'm prepared? OK. So there we go, red herring. Uh, let me just make sure my internet is working. Woohoo! Internet is working. OK, so apparently I'm going to right click and say manage new get packages. And we're going to browse. I'm just going to type in ninject. And you bring in the one that has 3 million downloads. <laughs> and you can see there's other ones as well. So um, like MVC5 has its own built-in container, but you can replace it with something else. So there's other packages for that. I'm just going to bring this in. We'll hit install. OK, firstborn child, blah, blah, blah. OK, so now he's installed. Now I have a reference that says ninject <laughs> inside my project references. So. If I try to be a lazy program again, I kernel control dot. That's what I'm looking for. So Visual Studio says, hey, would you like to add a using statement for that? <laughs> yes, please. I do that. And now at the top of my class, I've got using Ninject. Woohoo! I love stuff like that. So uh, we'll call this container, since that's what it is. And then you'll notice that in addition to the compose objects method, I also have a configure container method. 
So we'll start out by just creating an instance of our container. So we'll say container equals new, and I'm going to say standard kernel. And that's just what Ninject calls its normal everyday container. There are also custom kernels that you can build. It's an interface, so you can build your entire own one if you're one of those people. Um, we'll just use the standard kernel. Now what I need to do is tell Ninject how to associate my abstractions with my concrete types. Now in this case, my abstraction is my iPerson repository interface. And then my concrete types would be my service repository, my CSV repository. So let's go ahead and say container dot, and this is what I love about the Ninject syntax, I just say bind I person repository, my abstraction, dot to service repository, my concrete type. So I'm just creating that association. I'm telling Ninject, hey, if somebody wants an I person repository, please give them a service repository. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward so far. Okay, so I still need to get my main window, right? So we'll say application.current.mainWindow, that's the property, equals. Now, I don't want to new things up here because I want to let the container handle all of that. When I'm using my dependency injection container, I kind of want to stay away from newing anything up myself as much as possible. Let the container do it. So rather than newing it up, I'm going to say container.get main window. So I'm just going to say to the Ninject container, hey, get me a main window. And that's all I have to do. Really? That, yeah, that doesn't look right, does it? Well, let's try running this and see what happens. OK. OK, now my title says Ninject, so I know I'm in the right, the right project. Click the button. Oh, works. Where's the view model? Where's the view model? When I did this wiring up myself, I needed a main window view model in there somewhere, didn't I? Isn't it picking up the concrete type on its own? It's picking up everything on its own. Let me tell you how containers work. They use reflection. They use a lot of reflection. So what happens is when I ask Ninject, please get me a main window, it says, OK, do I know what a main window is? Well, yes, I do. I have an assembly reference to it. Otherwise, this wouldn't compile. Let me look at its constructors. And it looks through the constructors and finds the most complicated one that it can understand. <laughs> now, in our case, we don't have to worry about that because we have one constructor. Our main window uh, constructor has uh, one parameter, which is a main window view model. So Ninject says, OK, do I know what a main window view model is? Well, yes, I do, because I have an assembly reference to uh, peopleviewer.presentation, okay, where our view model lives. So it's searching through all of the DLLs that are part of this project, and it says, OK, I know what a main window view model is. I've got a reference to it. Let me look at its constructors. Well, it has one constructor, and it needs an iPerson repository. And it says, OK, do I know what an iPerson repository is? Well, yes, I have this mapping that says if someone asks for an iPerson repository, I should give them back a service repository. Great, do I know what that is? Yes, I have an assembly reference for the service repository. I look at its constructors. Oh, it just has a default constructor, no parameters. Great, let me new that up. Use that to new up the main window view model. Use that to new up the main window. Here you go. And that's the magical part. <laughs> now, if this it's how you get introduced to dependency injection in this project, which again, one screen application. <laughs> it looks like magic. And that's why I wanted to take you through that other process. Containers are awesome, they do a lot of work for you. But if you don't understand what they're doing, it's very difficult to use them correctly. So how does it yell at you if you don't do that, that binding right there after the new kernel? Uh, this guy right here? Yeah. Uh, you'll actually get a runtime error. So at this point, uh, if it can't resolve it, uh, let's see. So I got an activation exception. Let me zoom in on that. And this is pretty common, <laughs> pretty much amongst every container that you'll come to. 
Uh, so you can see I got an activation exception, and it says error activating iPerson repository. So it says, I don't know how to do one of these. And it'd be the same thing if I were to, for example, remove the assembly reference where my main window view model is, I'd get error activating main window view model. It's like, I don't know what this is. Actually, it might be able to figure that one out because the main window project references that assembly. I've never tried that. <laughs> we won't try that right now. <laughs> good, good thing to try when you get home. So um, it does get a bit frustrating because if you don't have the right things, these errors are, especially if you have a lot of objects. I mean, we've got like five objects we're dealing with here. It's not that complex. But when you have a lot of objects in play, it can get pretty nasty. This is a, uh, looks like it's the, that same decorator you did before, looks like in this scenario. You want to use the decorator? It's like he's reading ahead. <laughs> before I do that, though, I want to show you one other thing about containers. And this is one reason why I really encourage people to use containers. So let's go back to our configuration. And I'm going to keep dotting, because this has a very fluid interface. So I'm going to say dot in. And you'll notice I have some options here for in scope, in singleton scope, in thread scope, and in transient scope. What this is doing is it's doing lifetime management, which is really, really cool. This is something you really don't want to program yourself. So for example, let's say I say in singleton scope. This is a method, and let's go ahead and make that a bit easier to see. So in singleton scope means I only want to have one of these objects, service repositories. So if in the course of me resolving objects, the first time I ask Ninject for an iPerson repository, it's going to new up a service repository and give it back to me. The second time I ask for an iPerson repository, it's going to give me the same one that it already has in memory. So I'll only have one instance of these at any time. So that's great. I want to use the same instance over and over again. Now, another one of these scopes was called transient scope. And what that means is give me a new instance every time I ask for one. So I ask for an iPerson repository, give me a new service repository. I ask for another iPerson repository, give me another new service repository. There's also in thread scope, which means give me one for each thread that I have going in my application. That's code you do not want to write yourself, <laughs> trust me. And so this is something that containers do that is really, really awesome. Uh, so you want to know how to use the caching repository. OK. Let's see if I can get this right. So I can keep dotting dot with, oh sweet, with constructor arguments. <laughs> so actually, let's go ahead and change this. So I'll change this from service repository to a caching repository. OK, now if I were to stop right here, I would have a problem. Because when it tries to new up the caching repository, it's going to say, well, the caching repository needs a parameter, which is an iPerson repository. How do I create one of those? Well, I need a caching repository. <laughs> so it would go like this, right? And we stack overflow. Actually, the containers smart enough to figure out that it has a circular reference at that point, so it's going to blow up. But instead, what I want to do is I want to say, you know what? For that constructor argument, I want you to use something different. So I can say, with constructor argument, and let's see if I can do this right. Now you'll notice there's seven overloads, so there's several different ways of doing this. <laughs> OK, I think I want to use, uh, let's use this one. So I can pass in the type. Well, OK, let me do it the simple way first, which people hate it when I do this. So I have a parameter called wrapped repository. And what I need to do is pass in the object to use here. Now, I want to use a service repository. But I don't want to just new up a service repository here, because that would kind of be defeating the purpose of using the container. So what I would say is I'd ask the container to get me a service repository. And this is where the code gets kind of nasty. Beep. 
So if I look at my caching repository, let's just go to this definition. Its constructor, oh, it's actually called wrapped person repository. So wrapped <laughs> person repository. The joy of using quoted strings, which is why we want to avoid this. I'll show you that in a minute. So what this is saying is, hey, when you create the caching repository, you're going to come across a parameter called wrapped person repository. Rather than getting into your endless loop, because it's one of these, please go ahead and use a service repository. Now it wants me to pass in an object here, which is why I'm actually asking the container to get it rather than telling it the type. So if I do this, it will actually use the caching, it will use the caching repository with the service repository wrapped. So there's our data. And again, let's go ahead and turn off IIS Express. So we'll exit out of that. And we'll just clear data a few times until our 30 seconds expires. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Come on, you can do it. 30 seconds is a really long time when you do this. <laughs> Come on. You can do it. I know you can do it. You are actually working, aren't you? There you go. <laughs> okay, and there's our no data available. So we can see our caching repository is working the same way that it did before. Now, hopefully a lot of you are saying, I don't like quoted strings because <laughs> those are subject to change. You type them wrong, it doesn't work. You change the name of the, prop the parameter in the constructor. Now it's completely broken. Well, we can actually use another overload here uh, because in addition to accepting a string name, we can also pass in a type. So instead of using the name, I can say type of iPerson repository. So I'm saying, I want you to, if inside the constructor, if you find a parameter that's an iPerson repository inside the constructor, go ahead and use this object. So I don't have to reference the parameter by name, I can reference the parameter by type. Now obviously if, if you have multiple iPerson repositories inside a constructor, it can get interesting. <laughs> and then this will work the same way, except now we don't have that magic string anymore, which makes people really happy. So there we go. I won't go through the whole caching thing, but we can see we are actually getting data from our service. Pretty cool, huh? Now I'm showing you about 2% of what containers are capable of. I'm not actually here to teach you what containers are capable of. I'm here to teach you the cool stuff behind dependency injection so that now the containers don't look like magic anymore. <laughs> Do you want to see another container? Sure, okay. Again, you guys aren't real enthusiastic. Okay, <laughs> so let's look at Unity. Now, Unity is a container that I have used in production. Um, and the syntax is not quite as friendly, which is why I'm not a big fan of using it. Let's see if I have, nope, apparently I need to start from scratch here as well. So let's pop open the, uh, app.xaml.cs, and you can see we've got kind of an empty one like we saw with an inject. So I'll do the same thing. We'll go ahead and add a new get package for Unity. And then you want to make sure you're getting Unity, the dependency injection container, not Unity, the 3D <laughs> gaming awesome framework. And uh, you'll see here by Microsoft, the Unity application block is a lightweight, extensible dependency injection container. So we can just go ahead and pull that guy in. Uh, yes, firstborn child. Has anyone actually read one of those? Like, just give it to me. Okay, <laughs> installed successfully. And we'll see that this process is very similar to what we saw with an inject, other than our syntax is different. Now this actually calls it an I container. Container. And again, I'll do control dot to bring in the using statement. Uh, that was totally not the right one. <laughs> Let's try again. System.component model. Oh wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> I Unity container. Yeah, Jeremy, get this right. <laughs> okay, control dot. Much better. Microsoft.praxis.unity. That's the that's the assembly that I want. And we'll go ahead and call this container. 
And we'll go through pretty much the same process that we did with Ninjet. So first I need to create an instance of it. So container equals new Unity container. And then I need to set up the mapping. This is where the syntax will drive you insane. Microsoft loves these really long names for things that don't necessarily tell you what they mean. <laughs> so if I say container dot, uh, container dot, usually I end up scrolling through this and saying, OK, what do I want? Oh, how about register type? That sounds good. That's terribly obvious what I want. Now, this actually takes two different generic type parameters, the thing that I'm the abstraction and the concrete type. So I could say iPerson repository and service repository, like that. Syntax is not as friendly as bind this to that. <laughs> Again, I really like the syntax of Ninject, but you know it gets the point across. Now, um, if you do want to use the lifetime management, this is where things get fun. Because rather than dotting in another method in singleton scope, in thread scope, we actually add a parameter to this register type where we new up a lifetime manager. So we can say new container, container controlled lifetime manager. <laughs> you like that name? So container controlled lifetime manager means transient. <laughs> yeah, do you like that? So <laughs> yeah, you'll want to read the documentation. Now the good thing is the documentation for Unity is very extensive. So it will cover pretty much every scenario that you need to deal with. And that includes constructor parameters and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to show you how to do that because off the top of my head, I don't remember how I'd have to look it up. So we'll just leave it at this for now. And then again, we need to set our main window. So application.current.mainWindow. And we say container.get would be awesome, right? No, we want to resolve the object. So we'll resolve the main window. Now this works exactly the same way that Ninject does. So it's going to look, look at the constructors, figure out the parameters, you know, use reflection, go through the different assemblies, figure out what it needs to do. And then it will give us you know, exactly what we want. So OK, the title says Unity. That means we're in the right one. And I don't know why this guy's freaking out. <laughs> there we go. So. There we are getting data from our uh, um, service. And I'll go ahead and change our mapping to use the CSV repository. And now Unity is giving us the extra record. So again, the containers work in a very similar fashion, but the syntax, the approaches are a little bit different. OK, I've got one more thing to show you, which is late binding. You guys interested in that? Yes. Let me tell you why late binding is especially compelling for our particular scenario. So the scenario that I just described is our company is supplying software to multiple clients. Each client potentially has a different data store. Now, to me, it doesn't make sense that I supply every client with every data store. right? That doesn't make sense. If this client is using SQL Server, I should just be able to give him the SQL Server repository DLL and not the service DLL, not the CSV DLL, right? And if I have to come up with a new one, because now I've got someone who's using Hadoop, I don't want to have to rebuild the entire application. <laughs> I want to give you the one DLL you need, leave the rest of the application the same. Late binding allows us to do that. Now, unfortunately, Ninject does not do late binding out of the box. And that's because uh, one of the tenants of the Ninject project is we free you from XML uh, configuration. And that's fine. <laughs> now, doing it yourself is not a big deal. It's about five lines of reflection code if you want to do it yourself. And in fact, if you uh, watch my Pluralsight course on C Sharp interfaces, I actually show those five lines of reflection code to load up something off the file system. In fact, these same repositories we're using today. All of my examples use exactly the same code, so I don't get confused. <laughs> so except manual process rather than using DI for that. OK, so um, we're going to be looking at Unity, which again, not real preferred. And Unity has a very opinionated way of how to do late binding. So let me go ahead and just start this as the startup project. We'll go ahead and shut this down. And 
I believe this is all done, so I don't have to write anything. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> I like that. So this is using Unity. And um, actually, before I point out anything else, let's look at the uh, references that we have on the project. So if I zoom in on this, get that guy out of the way. One thing that you won't see here is you won't see any references to my repositories. OK, so I have a reference to peopleviewer.presentation. This holds my view model. But we don't see anything here that says personrepository.csv, personrepository.service. Right? So I have no compile time references to those. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do some runtime binding. In all the previous uh, examples, you have the references, right? Yes, that's correct. So if we look at the one we just looked at, I do have the CSV and the service references, as well as the caching repository. So again, that's because it's using reflection to go through all that. But in this case, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Now, this code is already done, so you don't have to watch me type it. Woohoo! <laughs> and uh, same thing. So here's my iUnity container. And then in configure container, I knew it up. But notice, rather than creating that mapping using register type, I'm saying load configuration. Now, my, I resolve things the same way. I still say resolve main window, exactly the same thing. But rather than doing this manually, I'm doing it in configuration. Now, Unity is limited in that it must use the app.config file. So it can't use an arbitrary XML or configuration file. You have to put it in the app.config. And to do this, we'll bring in a configuration section, because Unity has its special configuration section. And then here's the section that we're actually looking at. Now, when we see this, it's going to look a lot like the stuff that we saw when we were doing it manually. Now, I can reference some namespaces here. So here I'm referencing the common namespace. That actually contains the interface, as well as the, peop the person property, or person object, I should say person class. <laughs> there we go. It must be getting late. Uh, then I also have a namespace reference to person repository.csv and person repository.service. Again, there's no compile time references to those. We're just saying, hey, here's some namespaces you can expect to find. And then I give it the assembly names. So it's going to look for common.dll, person repository.csv.dll, person repository.service.dll. Now, in this particular project, I have a post build step on the project so that when I build the application, it automatically copies those repository DLLs into the output folder. So I know if I open up the bin debug folder, it will have these DLLs in there, even though I don't have compile time references. So this kind of sets up, here's the assemblies we'd like to use. And then we have uh, this container uh, tag. And inside it, we have a registration. Now, what method did we use? We used a method called register type, didn't we? Huh. Register type, <laughs> iPerson repository, map to service repository. This is actually easier to read than <laughs> the register type method. And then notice, I do have the option of including a lifetime manager. So here's lifetime container controlled lifetime manager. And so now this is going to look at the uh, file systems at runtime and figure out what we want to use. So we'll go ahead and bring this up. There we're hitting our service repository. I'll come in here, change my configuration to CSV repository. Now, the only reason I have both of the assemblies and namespaces in here is so that I don't have to type it all in when I change these. But you can't just have the one you're using. So I'll change my configuration, rerun my application. Now I'm hitting the CSV repository. And that's coming off the file system at runtime. Now, why is this compelling? This is really compelling if you're in a position like I was in, where I was responsible for packaging and deploying applications and giving them to my clients. <laughs> because I have this core application, which hasn't changed. But I want to use a new data store. Okay? So I have a client that says, you know what? We want to use Hadoop. Great. Let me go ahead and create that hadoop.dll, person repository.hadoop. And again, it will implement that interface and have all the code. And I'll make sure that I test all that code, make sure it works. 
And then all I have to do is go to my client and say, OK, here's your new DLL and change this configuration at runtime. In fact, let me, let me show that because it's not real clear what's happening since I'm rebuilding here. Let me open up the output folder here. Uh, file Explorer, bin debug, and let's just go ahead and double click on the executable. I run it using the CSV repository because that's what my configuration file says. I can come in here, hand edit my configuration file. So instead of using the CSV repository, it uses the service repository. I just save that, double click, now I'm using the service. So there it's really easy to tell I didn't rebuild anything. And so the same thing would happen with the Hadoop repository. Here's your DLL, put it in your output folder. Here's how to change the configuration, go. I don't have to change my main executable. What that means is my main executable doesn't have to go through QA and acceptance testing again. My main executable doesn't have to go through packaging again. My main executable doesn't have to be redeployed to all of my clients again. That is huge in the world that I've worked in. <laughs> now there is a huge drawback to this. When we have the runtime binding, let me show you. <laughs> this is really cool. How do we debug this? <laughs> so uh, let's actually go to our view model. And let's set a breakpoint right here. Repository.getPeople. So let's go ahead and run this application. And we'll click on the button. And I say, I want to know what code is behind this get people method. OK, so I'll use the step into method, or the step into whatever keyboard shortcut, F11. Oh, crap, it worked. <laughs> That's because I have references in this solution. So <laughs> if you don't have references to the DLLs in the solution, which I should have tested that before, <laughs> it actually doesn't know where to find that file. And so it actually makes it harder to debug. Why did that actually work? Now I'm all curious. Uh, let me change my config. Uh, let me rebuild. Is there a PDB on the yeah, there probably is. So there's a PDB file because I am using debug builds for all of the DLLs. So it's probably looking at that and saying, oh, here's where the code file is. This is why I should always check this stuff in advance. <laughs> I actually have a specific example that shows not getting to the code. But you can teach it how to get to the code. So um, it actually does make debugging a lot more interesting when you're trying to step through code and, and things like that. And then the other thing is, what if instead of a CSV repository, I have a CVS repository? Well, it just ain't going to work, right? I'm going to get a runtime error. Yeah, and in fact, um, because my users don't run in debug mode, start without debugging. That's what my users see. <laughs> it doesn't even start up because, again, I'm in the app.xaml.cs, my application startup file. So if that doesn't work, it's not even, I haven't even gotten to the point where I can show you that stupid dialogue that says something went wrong. Do you want to debug or quit? hasn't even gotten that far. My application won't even start. So whenever we start saying, well, I'm going to use configuration, well, that's a string. It doesn't get compiled. So if you type it wrong, or the DLL's not in the right folder, or the DLL gets renamed, or, 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 then you can end up with runtime errors that are pretty nasty to try to figure out. So let's change that back to CSV repository. Much better. Oh, get people. Can I step into this one? Oh, look at that. <laughs> so it knows where step is. Um, and quite honestly, if I were in that scenario that I just described, I would probably have all of those repository assemblies in the same solution, even if they're not you know, being compile time binded. <laughs> That's totally not the right word. <laughs> even if I don't have the compile time binding, I'd probably have them in the same solution for maintenance purposes and debugging and whatnot. 
So, okay. Cool. Are there any questions? How did I do? <laughs> so dependency injection, as you can tell, I do get very excited about it because it helps us out in a lot of situations. So let's see what we actually did tonight. So I managed to break the tight coupling between my view model and my repository by, again, putting in the interface so we don't care about a particular concrete type, and then adding the constructor parameter so that we have constructor injection going on. Now, because I did that, that means my view is no longer tightly bound to my service. And that's what makes me really happy. Now, we also did loosen this coupling a bit so that we could swap out uh, our production service for a fake one using property injection in our testing scenarios. But again, not having that big tight coupling all the way down in my application, that makes me a lot happier. Again, I'm not real concerned about this because this really is generally a one-to-one -one relationship in my world. And I'm not real concerned about this because these guys kind of have to know about each other as well. But I'm much, much happier, and we've seen how much easier it is just with making that one change to be able to swap out different repositories, add caching with the decorator pattern, add unit testing with tests that are really easy to read and easy to write. And um, let's see how close I came to talking. So everything with an asterisk is stuff I was supposed to talk about. So I did talk about constructor injection and property injection, and we did look at object composition and the composition root. And actually, while we're talking about it, that was the one other thing I wanted to talk about. Now, in the applications that we were looking at here, I basically had separate copies of this WPF application for each of these things that were in my, quote, view folder. So this Unity project, in addition to app, the app.xaml, also had the main window.xaml. And then for the late binding, it has the app.xaml plus the main window.xaml. So I actually have copies of the view in each of these applications. Now what's common to do in especially, uh, actually probably not at all in web applications, but in desktop applications, is to create a separate project which is known as the bootstrapper. And that bootstrapper project would only have the application startup code. And it would say, OK, I want you to bring in this view. I want you to bring in this view model. I want you to bring in this repository. So in that scenario, we would only have one copy of this main window.xaml in its own project. And then we would have a separate bootstrapper application that would be doing the startup for the whole thing. So um, and if you want some more information on that, on my Pluralsight course on dependency injection, I actually show the bootstrapper in particular. So if you'd like to see that. So our object composition happens in the composition root. Now, that also can get interesting depending on what we're doing. Because again, this composition uses reflection, which is slow. Reflection is slow compared to calling things directly. So we kind of want to minimize the amount of reflection. And we might want to minimize how much we do at one time. So for example, a project that I worked on, we had probably about 40 screens, about 12 different modules, and we were using dependency injection to kind of bring everything in. Now, the way that we did it so that we didn't have this really heavy startup of the application is we would just basically bring up the menu screen. And then when someone selected one of those items, we would load up that particular module. And that would go through the object composition for that module. So if you're going into the thing where we're adding new items all the time, we're going to go ahead and keep that one in memory because you're constantly going there. But for the administration screens that aren't used very frequently, well, once you're done with that, we're going to let it go. So we won't keep that in memory. We'll, it'll be a slower startup, but that's OK because it's not frequently used. And then for the frequently used stuff, after we create it the first time, we'll keep it in memory so you get that really quick action every time you go to it. So there's a lot of options, a lot of possibilities that you can do with this. Web applications also kind of <laughs> work in their own way. Um, if you guys are really interested, I can show you an example of that. If you're not, that's OK. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, you know, the, kind of each environment, depending on what your concerns are, maybe memory pressure is a concern, maybe startup time is a concern. So you kind of balance where you do this resolution based on that. It's not 
easy. <laughs> I'll tell you that. It will take some trial and error. And I would definitely recommend looking at some of the smart people. Steve Smith, again, Ardalis, he does a lot of DI stuff. Miguel Castro also does a lot of DI stuff. And so they're really good resources for some of those things. Uh, DI containers. I did show you Ninject. And in fact, I showed you Unity as well, which is not started there. <laughs> so we looked at two of these uh, six containers here. And then again, we did see the benefits. So we saw extensibility. We were, e we were able to swap out different repositories. We were able to add caching functionality. Uh, we actually saw late binding as well, where we can make those decisions at runtime rather than compile time. And then, of course, I showed how easy the unit tests are to write. And as promised, I totally did not talk about the solid principles at all. <laughs> Actually, I think I did kind of touch on the single responsibility principle when I was talking about how it's not the view model's responsibility to decide which data store we're going to use. And so that's what I've got for you tonight. And yet, unless you guys are really, really curious and you want to see three minutes of what this might look like in an MVC application. Nobody's that curious. Oh, okay, people are curious. Okay. Um, of course I don't have a link to it there. That would be way too easy. Uh, <laughs> I know where this is because I used it uh, two weeks ago. Dev uh, workshop. Okay, not that one. Sessions, workshop, DI, MVC. There we go. Boop. Boop. Okay, now I am not a web developer and my UIs really kind of stink. <laughs> so uh, let me just run this application to start with so you can get an idea of what it looks like. It's basically the default ASP.NET template with some things that I added. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. There we go. It's the commander's warehouse where we can go to our products and we can buy things like leather captain's chairs, landing shuttles, moon bases. Moon bases are kind of expensive. Name badges are kind of cheap. <laughs> Spacesuits, starships. That might give you a hint of what my data set was. So <laughs> it's a pretty simple application. But what I have here, oh, OK. Solution Explorer, there we go, is a pretty much bog standard um, uh, ASP.NET MVC application. So let's go ahead and look at that product screen that we we're just looking at. And so here's the product controller. Now, one thing to notice is that in the constructor of the product controller, I'm using constructor injection. So I'm saying, OK, I need a repository. I need an I repository of product. OK, so I've created an interface and a generic interface, so I can use the same interface with multiple types. So I can have an I repository of product, I repository of person, et cetera, et cetera. So that means that when this controller gets created, someone needs to provide me with this repository. Now, the way that we do that, uh, or one way that we can do that is to create a custom controller factory. And because I can never remember exactly what folder this is in, I'm just going to do a search for Ninject. <laughs> oh, wait, find in files. There we go. Ninject. Uh, that looks good. Ninject controller factory, which is apparently in my infrastructure folder. <laughs> And what this is, is this is a custom controller factory. So it inherits from the default controller factory. But this code should look familiar, because it's basically what we saw. Here's our iKernel. When our controller factory gets uh, fired up, it's going to go ahead and new up a standard kernel. And then notice I have this add bindings method. And here's all my bind from this to that. OK, so that looks familiar. And then. Um, the custom controller factory, the method you want to override is this get controller instance. And then in here, rather than newing up the controller, it's going to ask Ninject to get it. So I'm going to say Ninject get whatever my controller is that I'm coming in. And again, it'll go through that reflection process of figuring out, oh, OK, you want an iRepository product? OK, I need a product repository, blah, 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 blah. So this is part of the controller factory itself. And so uh, again, we can go through, swap things out, things like that. 
And then uh, to actually use this, uh, control, okay, right click, find all references. There we go. So inside the global ASAX, all the configuration stuff keeps moving around in MVC. That's why I have to do searches for this. I don't remember where it is. So in our application start, we're saying, hey, set the controller factory to our custom inject controller factory. Does that make sense? Now, uh, the current, current versions of MVC have a built-in container, which I really haven't worked much with. Uh, Mark Seaman is actually not a fan of the built-in container, but you can definitely swap in your own. Uh, Steve Smith, again, Ardalis, he has gone through and said, okay, here's how to use structure map with ASP.NET MVC. Here's how to use autofac with ASP.NET MVC. So he would be a good reference if you want to try to figure out how to get those references in. Okay, did I do that in three minutes or less? <laughs> awesome. Uh, again, that's not the world that I live in, so I don't know a whole lot about it. Okay, and apparently my slides went away. Let me just bring up my last slide so you can remember me. Show. Okay, you guys can remember what a great evening it was. Boy, that seems so long ago, doesn't it? <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Boy, loose coupling, awesome. Late binding, awesome. Okay, and again, this is me. If you do have any questions that come up later, feel free to shoot me an email. What I found is if one person has a question, other people probably do too, so they turn into great blog articles. And again, if you hit my website, you'll be able to get the slides, the code samples, a PDF walkthrough, links to a whole bunch of different articles because I've been giving this talk for four years, so lots of people have asked lots of questions. And again, also a link to the Pluralsight course if you would like the extended version of what I talked about tonight. <laughs>